Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 edition of the International Mother Language Day celebrations at the University of Reading. Um, International Mother Language Day is celebrated every year on February the 21st to promote linguistic and cultural diversity and multilingualism around the world. And the idea to celebrate International Mother Language Day was the initiative of Bangladesh, and it was approved at the 1999 um, UNESCO General Conference and has been observed throughout the world since 2000. And this is the fifth consecutive year uh, that we hold a public event um, to celebrate this important date uh, at the Center for Literacy and Multilingualism. Um, but it's the first time that we do this online. So the downside is that we cannot be in the same room, uh, but on the upside, we have 488 registered participants from 56 different countries and six continents. Uh, but we always miss someone from Antarctica in our own online events, so we must do better. Uh, this year is also special uh, because this event is jointly hosted by um, the Centre for Book Cultures and Publishing, uh, Book Cultures and Publishing at the University of Reading, and I am delighted to welcome two of the co-directors, uh, Professor Daniela La Penna uh, and our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Sophie Hayward. Uh, and my name is Ludovica Serratrice, and I'm the director of the Centre for Literacy and Multilingualism. So Sophie uh, is Associate Professor in French, and he, she's currently one of the directors of the Center for Book Cultures and Publishing at the University of Reading. She's a specialist in the history of children's literature and publishing in French and transnational perspectives. Um, she has published widely on these topics in French and English, and she was recently a Studium uh, Maurice Klodowska Curie Research Fellow at the University of Tours, uh, where she led the research project, The Children's 68, uh, which she'll tell us a little bit about tonight. And she's currently completing a book manuscript on children's publishing uh, in Cold War France. Uh, my colleague Daniela will tell you a little bit more about uh, their centre, and I just want to say a couple of words about um, the Centre for Literacy uh, and uh, Multilingualism, for those of you who are new to it. So CELM, as we call it, uh, is an interdisciplinary research centre uh, that brings together researchers from linguistics and applied linguistics, psychology, education, modern languages and cultures and neuroscience. And our mission is to conduct world-class research and to train the next generation of researchers, but also to engage with practitioners and the public at large on issues related to the many different aspects of multilingualism in children and adults. So we're very proud to be co-hosting this public lecture today to celebrate International Mother Language Day. So before I pass the floor uh, to my colleague Daniela, just a couple of words on the logistics of the event, uh, so there'll be no fire drill. Um, Sophie's talk will last approximately 40 minutes and there will be ample time for questions from the audience. Um, we ask you to post the questions in the Q&A rather than the chat um, so that Daniela, who uh, is moderating, can keep um, an eye on them. So um, without further ado, I will pass the floor to my colleague Daniela, uh, who will then introduce Sophie. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to um, outline to you um, the um, remits and the mission of the Centre for Book Cultures and Publishing of the University of Reading. Uh, the centre undertakes research in book cultures and publishing with a distinctive global multilingual and multidisciplinary uh, focus. Uh, the centre aligns expertise in English, Spanish, French, German and Italian language publishing and book history with transatlantic and European research partners partnerships in typography and book design, Latin and non-Latin scripts, and in the printing and publishing trades. And uh, researchers in the center have shared interest in the materiality of text and image, uh, both analog and digital, uh, in how digital methods can announce scholarship and the ways in which books are produced, distributed and read in global contexts today and in the past. And Reading's renowned collections in uh, book printing and publishing history and facilities and technical expertise to explore the making of type and printing processes underpin this research. As uh, Ludovica has said, uh, Sophie Haywood is one of the uh, co-directors and actually this year she is director in chief. Um, Sophie's work, as uh, Ludovica has uh, mentioned, um, interrogates what 
what we understand to be uh, children's culture and how this shifts across time and place, providing historical perspectives on the assumptions that have shaped children's uh, creative industries. Uh, her work uh, is informed by uh, rigorous archival research and her approach brings together publishing history, ideas of nation and notions of the child. And all these ideas are reflected in the uh, research project that uh, underpins uh, the um, research findings that uh, Sophie will share with us uh, today. So it is a, you know, a great pleasure for me to then pass the floor to my colleague Sophie and uh, learn from her. Okay, and here, has that worked? Can you see the picture? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much Ludovica and Daniela for, for uh, the introductions there and also thank you so much to Ludovica for the um, invitation to speak at this, this uh, special event. And, um, and thank you above all, hello and welcome to everyone who's tuning in. Um, it's, it's amazing and, and utterly overwhelming, I think, uh, the ability we have now to kind of speak to people from across the world and lots of exciting people from the comfort of our own home. Uh, so I can't see you, but I'm, I'm guessing you're there, so hello. <laughs> um, so as Daniela and Ludovica said, you know, today's project comes, today's talk uh, comes out of a project that I ran uh, working with lots of wonderful and talented uh, people from across Europe and which I called the Children's 68. And in this project, we looked at how children's books and media became caught up in the current of turbulent protest and countercultural agitation that characterized the years around 1968 across Europe and indeed across the globe. Um, so to kind of introduce you, I thought what I'd do is I'd, I'd take your hand and, and kind of plunge us into the imaginary, into the kind of children's culture of the era being some of what was going on, to just give you a brief sense of some of the things that we were looking at um, and, and what was going on in children's culture. Uh, sorry, so there is the website to the project. Um, so we kind of see a new motif um, emerging. People felt that what they were doing is revolutionary, I guess, is why I'm highlighting this. So we see the children's version of the, the raised fist of the revolutionary. Here we can see examples of publishers' logos using it. And even in the case of the 1969 German picture book, Fünffinger sind eine Faust, Five Fingers are a Fist, it formed the subject of an entire story. Other books looked revolutionary. Um, here with the bold green, the bold red circle on a vivid green background on the cover of the Italian artist Iella Mari's Little Red Balloon from 1967, calls to my mind at least uh, the kind of third world revolutionary flags, liberation flags that we see being waved in the streets in 68. Um, and we'll come back to that later on that little theory of mine. Um, while other picture books came deliberately packaged in the revolutionary colours of black and red, or indeed, to borrow Tommy Ungerer's phrase, packed a visual punch inspired by the innovations in graphic design going on in this period. There were also, and this was a particular favourite, I think, in Scandinavian countries, manifestos for revolt for children. Um, Scandinavia the Danes produced the incendiary on the left here, Little Red School Book uh, in 1969, which taught school children that all adults are paper tigers and caused a global publishing scandal. And then here on the right, we have uh, also from 1969, um, the Swedish Francis Vestin's Manual of Child Indoctrination, which advocated systematically and from a very young age teaching children to disobey, because obedience is what had led, of course, to the um, guards in concentration camps uh, obeying orders. Okay, so here she's kind of developed this idea of counter indoctrination. The Danes also produced politicized television programs for preschoolers, such as this uh, television program, Sigalina. And here 
is the Sigalina and the Escape from America in 1970, which featured scenes of police brutality against the Black Panthers. And even Britain, which had been relatively unaffected by the events of 68, witnessed the publication in 1972 here of the children's bust book edition of the children's rights magazine in 1972, which advised children on how to resist arrest. And then in the same, at the same time in the early 70s, we see two landmark obscenity trials um, centered on countercultural underground publications ostensibly aimed at school children, including the aforementioned Little Red School Book. Also in the UK in 1968, one of the leading activists of the children's rights movement, Lila Berg, started work on the school readers series Nippers which was designed to be a direct challenge to the white middle-class world depicted in children's reading books, such as the Ladybird series. Here, you can see on the left, using working class language, and then on the right, uh, Berg recruited Beryl Gilroy, one of the first black women to become a head teacher in the UK, here teaching black Britons to see, white Britons, sorry, to see black people as British. So the point, of departure for this project was to kind of was the observation that 68 is often seen as a watershed moment in quite a few national histories of children's literature and media so i'm a french specialist and you're, you're going to work that out i do refer a lot to france of course in this talk but in france you know it's very noticeable there have been many publications and books featuring writers, publication, publishers, artists, talking about how this period really changed their work, indeed, you know, made it possible for them to make and sell the kind of experimental children's literature that they wanted to make. So at a conference in 2005, the publisher Arthur Hubschmidt said, you know, you've got to talk about May 68, you know, why am I talking about it? Because it was everything, you know, it changed things for us radically. But we also see in histories of Italy, Scandinavian countries and also Germany, it's all seen to be an important moment. And the recurring idea seems to be one of rupture, that this was a moment of often dramatic desire for rebellion. And I'd like you to hold in your mind that, that idea of rupture. I'm going to return to it. But interestingly, by way of contrast, we, we saw that this was a periodization that was missing for a lot of, from a lot of British scholarship. Um, for example, you know, not everybody kind of sees this as an important moment. It's interesting, isn't it? The swinging 60s, um, we're not really seen as having played an important part, you know, been important to the historical narrative of modern children's literature in the UK. So, you know, you kind of wonder is, I think, talking to, um, people involved in the project, particularly Lucy Pearson, who wrote about the Nippers series, you know, she, she kind of said actually the political, social and cultural upheaval at the time um, did affect children's books and it was actually quite a useful lens, um, you know, to kind of uh, enter into dialogue with other histories, um, thinking about 68 as an important moment, so it was quite a useful way of looking at things. And so, this is the kind of the two ideas that were, you know, the two things that were really at the heart of what we were trying to do with this project. And this is where I think it kind of, you know, in some ways fits with the, the kind of mother language day idea, but, you know, by working together across linguistic boundaries and kind of nationally focused histories of children's culture, and particularly by taking frameworks for analysis that are regularly used in some national contexts, and then applying them to others. You know, it helped us to kind of see and think about finding new stories to tell about the history and development of children's culture. And second, then the idea was kind of trying to find ways to get disciplines to dialogue as well. I mean, I wanted to get people thinking in new ways about children's culture um, and its place in that big narrative of history of 1968. You know, basically offering a new reading of 1968 for the 50th anniversary, you know, showing how it was important uh, for the way we think about children and how we speak to them. And so I used to kind of make this gag uh, in 2018 when I was involved in lots of kind of talks 
for the anniversary, I used to sort of say, well, you know, we know that the students and workers there on the barricades uh, going on strike, protesting, we know that they weren't calling for a better quality of children's literature, that that wasn't their concern. But, you know, I'm actually, I think really, I'm going to start to underscore in this talk now that perhaps I shouldn't have been so apologetic, you know, we're not that far away from it, because you know, the, the kind of political culture of 68, that radical rethinking of society and authority structures in particular that underpinned the political culture, certainly incorporated thinking about the family, the school, as authority and power structures that oppress the child and then, you know, kind of shape the adult into, into interiorizing the norms and conventions of society. Um, and so here on this slide, you know, you can see a couple of examples of theorists writing on the school. Um, and on the left hand side there, a May 68 poster critiquing the infantilization of the young and their suppression of their freedom of speech. So there is a kind of children's liberation movement that we see emerging. And childhood, child rearing, it's deeply politicized, deeply political. It's a process of socialization. Um, and the, there's a fascinating book by the French sociologist Julie Pagis, where she's looked at how 68ers as parents, so people who participated in 68, um, when they were parents, took alternative education child rearing incredibly seriously. You know, she details how there was a kind of a flourishing of alternative creches, nurseries, experiments with different types of family structures based around communal living and collective parenting, um, attempts to raise children in non-sexist ways, anti-authoritarian modes of parenting, you know, experimenting with new ways of structuring the parent-child relationship. And here I've just given some examples on the left-hand side. That is a picture of a creche sauvage, a, a wild a nursery, an alternative nursery set up in the Sorbonne in May 68 um, for children. And there on the right-hand side, I've got an image from a, a similar kind of um, anti-authoritarian Kinderladen uh, from Germany, um, so-called because they were usually set up, kind of improvised in old shops. So to draw all my introductory threads together, back together here, what goes hand in hand with this movement is a, think, a rethinking of children's books, their media, their culture, um, as they become sites for experimentation in the late 60s. Um, and it was an important means for critiquing prevailing ideas on children and their institutions such as schools, but also a way of kind of speaking to children differently. So I'm now in the talk going to focus on translation as a way of thinking about how connected this moment was. You know, we identified 68 as an important watershed moment in many countries. But by taking a comparative perspective, we could think about all the similarities and differences between what was considered radical and the ways in which the kind of movements of books and ideas could move things forward, could have an explosive effect. And so we could start to train, trace kind of axes of exchange of ideas and flows, trace flows of experimental books and translations. So. I think a good place now then to, to start talking about my case study, to, to start this talk properly, I guess, is to take us back into those heady days of 1968 in the Marxist publisher, uh, Francois Maspero's bookshop in France, in Paris, in the Latin Quarter, just around the corner from the Sorbonne, where so much of the events of May would take place in 68. This bookshop was a gathering place for student radicals, and particularly, um, it was the chic thing to be to be seen actually in, in, on campuses to be, you know, holding one of his reading one of his pioneering series of cheap paperback editions of leading Marxist and third world uh, anti imperialist thinkers such as I mean, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and so forth. But interestingly, amongst the shelves, bringing brimming with kind of literature and poetry from across the the world and these important political texts, 
Maspero's bookshop also had a dedicated space for children's literature, which was nestled next to the art books. And this was where you could procure rare copies of one of the most exciting and dangerous books for children in France at this time. And that was Max Illy Maxi Monstre, or Where the Wild Things Are. So um, I, I should apologize really for being maybe a little bit hammy here, but I suppose I wanted to make the point that uh, this book was kind of, um, yeah, the underground or slightly revolutionary in France. You had, it was underground. You had to go to places like Maspero to get hold of this book. And so the question really is why? Um, what's going on here? So this now classic book, Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are, published in 1963 and winner of the prestigious Caldecott Medal in 1964, published in the States, in New York. His talent had been nurtured by the legendary Ursula Nordstrom at Harper and Row. In New York, in the post-war period, the 1950s and 60s was a real creative center. And it was in, understood by many in the book trade to be where some of the most exciting work in children's books was being published, thanks in part to people like Ursula Nordstrom. So this, tale, I mean, I'm going to just briefly kind of reiterate the tale for, for just to kind of, uh, I'm sure you've, you, you're all aware of it, but it's the tale of the mischievous, rebellious Max, who dressed in his wolf costume, goes on an adventure, on a voyage, after a big fight with his mother, who calls him a wild thing, and Max says, turns around and shouts, I'll eat you up. And he's sent to bed without eating anything. And then he goes on a voyage to the land of the wild things, um, where there ensues a wild rumpus. And the innovative structure of the book sees the images slowly reach out across the pages uh, towards the words to eventually hear in this middle page, middle of the book, take over with the dancing and wild-eyed gnashing of the teeth of the terrible monsters before retreating again as the boy sails back to the safe shores of home. So Sendak was effectively speaking to children of anger and aggression and the intense, intense emotions of childhood and nightmares um, inspired by Sendak's own um, psychoanalysis that he'd gone through, undergone. So Sendak's book is not only kind of, I mean, it's aesthetically and um, formally innovative, um, but these innovations very much derive from his desire to kind of evoke emotions and childhood in a way that was kind of challenged to well-entrenched ideas about how books ought to speak to children and what, what um, you know, there's an essentially a kind of a liberationist desire here to kind of bust taboos and, and to, to talk about nightmares and the intense emotions of childhood. And it certainly had, the book in 1963 had caused a certain amount of disquiet in the United States on its publication. Many librarians, critics and parents expressed concern that it was too scary essentially. Um, as one librarian put it very poetically, this was not a book to be left where a sensitive child might come upon it at twilight. And famously as well, the psychologist Bruno Bettelheim worried about the effect on children it might have as it represented here deep anxieties about desertion and abandonment. So in 1964, in awarding Sendak the prestigious Caldecott Medal, the American Library Association was acknowledging, was kind of validating the importance of what Sendak was doing. And it was, according to um, uh, Grossberg, I think, you know, it's part of its work to, to recognize books that were written from a child liberationist perspective. Certainly, if we look at Sendak's acceptance speech, he, he talks about, he says, certainly we want to protect our children from new and painful experiences that are beyond their emotional comprehension and that intensify anxiety. 
but it is through fantasy that children achieve catharsis. It is the best means they have for taming the wild things. Um, and there, do you remember I was sort of meant, talked at the beginning about this importance, I think, for this idea of rupture, or of some kind of clash. Um, I think here, what I'm interested in, in the way Sendak talks about his book, is that kind of contrast, tension he, he identifies between our desire to protect children from painful experiences, and then the sort of importance of a certain freedom, um, catharsis. Um, so the, there is kind of, I'm following here, uh, Michael Grossberg um, talking about childhood in post-war America and the emergence of the children's rights movement, um, the kind of peak of a certain form of children's rights movement. He talks about there being two different modes this sort of caretaking mode and with an emphasis on children's right to protection. And then the opposite, which is the right to freedom, a liberationist mode. Um, and what we see in the 60s in the US, and I would align Sendak with that, is a sort of an, a growing emphasis on the right to freedom from over protection. And what I've described here is this tension that is, in a sense, inherent to children's literature, you know, between sort of freedom of creative expression and then also the kind of artist's need that the sort of explore the importance of having access to freedom of expression, exploring the human condition. But, you know, the sense also that children's literature needs to somehow be delineated from literature proper, proper I suppose. Um, and this tension that I've sort of bumbled my way through here. This tension, I think, was central to the cultural rebellion of children 68, that rupture, um, that idea of 68 as a watershed somehow, um, because it's a shift away from that protection-focused way of thinking on children's books and well-being that I think had really come to dominate in particular after the experience of two generations, several generations marked by two world wars. And now I'm going to develop this theory a little bit more by looking, um, using the kind of translation and reception of Sendak's book as a good way to explore this phenomenon. Because it's when Max travels that we see the extent to which he could be seen as the, the sort of radical potentials of the book. Okay. So in 1967, the British publisher, Bodley Head, took, took the risk and decided to publish it and arranged a large international printing partnership, a kind of co-edition co basically to defray the costs with the UK, Denmark, France and Sweden. I'm going to look at the French example because I'm a French, uh, French specialist, but also because uh, the book's translation and reception there was, according in the words of Maurice Sendak himself, a fiasco. And that's because uh, in the case of France, it was being imported into a market, into a country where children's literature was pretty rigidly regulated. So it's a really good example, I think, of where this rupture and tension is the operative word. The strict regulation of the children's, French children's book trade in the 1950s and 60s um, was, I think, you know, in many ways, um, the product of anxieties after the war, you know, anxieties about human nature and cruelty and that kind of desire to sort of invest the children of the future, protect them from, you know, sort of try sort of concern that they had somehow, that children had somehow be traumatized, but also a kind of a hope for the future that we could sort of prevent this again. And the theoretical backbone for this, this idea, this discourse was provided as well by the rise of child psychology including the popularization of Freud's theories that our early years play a key role in our psychic development and that childhood traumas can scar us for life. So certainly in France, that, that caretaking, that protectionist approach is, is really important. We see a growing cadre of specialists, of librarians, teachers, youth movements, child psychologists are really interested and worried about children's reading and what it can do, for, do to them. You know, here I'm just going to quote Henri Vallon, the, the French child psychologist and education reformer, 
who wrote, who kind of commissioned an extensive report on children's book publishing in 1956. And, you know, he writes very clearly, advances in microbial biology have, have led to the, the reduction in child mortality. Now we, the psychologists, you know we have this opportunity to really kind of improve children's moral environment the books and, and things they get access to the great concern in this period in the 50s is the 40s and 50s is american comics lurid american comics that's what they're worried about um and you know we see all sorts of crusades against comics and really fears about um children the impact of reading comics on children you know, in the US as well, but you know, all over the globe. But France nevertheless has the dubious honor of leading the field when it came to the surveillance of children's publications in the post-war era. So in 1949, in July, the Fourth Republic passed a law on publications destined for the young, not just comics, all publications. Um, such material must not depict in a favorable light criminal activities or all acts um, lying, banditry, uh, stealing, laziness, coward, cowardliness, hatred, um, all acts that might be termed as crimes or offences of a nature that might demoralise young readers. So we'll see other kind of comics codes and laws being brought in, but France really does, you know, no one goes as far as the French. So, and it sets up, we have a big commission set up to monitor the industry. So, at this point, what I want to do really is just underscore that this law is important, not so much because we see lots of publishers being locked, thrown, you know, locked in jail, and keys thrown away. That's not true. You know, they weren't. Um, but it's important because it's a verbalization, a sort of concretization of a structure of feeling of, of this kind of widely shared concern um, about the impact that children's reading matter could have. On, on their, their psyches. And I think what you also see is, is if you look at the recommendations that the commission sets out, you know, they set out these, these lengthy recommendations to publishers on how to produce, um, uh, you know, what sort of publications they should be producing, you know, how to modify their comics and, and so forth to make them good for children. They echo ideas that we see across kind of educational and welfare publications on, on books and so forth and what's interesting is their recommendations cover things like plot construction characterization heroes uh heroes in the relationship to their family and that they should have jobs and things like that but also overall design and that's what i'm interested um in i find you know publishers were advised to be really alert to the impact of a page covered in drawings rendered in tormented and tense lines and violent colours. Um, uh, what we see is, is an aesthetic vision, really, um, of children's reading matter that was very much born of a desire to prevent harm, to protect the child readers. So again, I hope you can kind of see what I'm drawing out is that tension. Um, and here, you know, it's very much France in the 1950s and early 60s is really kind of carefully regulating the industry and it's all around this this deep deep profound desire to 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 kind of prevent harm to protect the child reader so i think we can see how in france then sendak's wild things would make a profound impact um and certainly what's interesting is is sendak's book when it's published um in France is essentially, I think, kind of spurned by the critics, that's what we think. So they they don't talk about it at all. It is kind of, it, it's, there's just this kind of unhelpful silence. And this is how we find that one of the bookshops that was prepared to stock this, this book uh, was the revolutionary activist, Francois Maspero. You know, it, it does have this kind of underground status. And in France, then there's this kind of um, legend, really, that that's sort of grown up around um, Sendak's book, um, you know, as, as being part of this kind of rupture, this moment of, of the 68 of children's books, you know, the, the part of the shaking up of things. 
um, for this new generation of publishers that we see emerge in the 60s that has become deeply frustrated by this the post-war kind of cocooning of the child and the disastrous effect it kind of had on children's book production. So let's look briefly now at the translation itself. The French publisher then in the co-edition agreement um, in that international partnership was Robert Delpierre, who was an art publisher, a photographer, curator and editor. Um, and he does have a small but well-regarded series for children, series of books for children that he publishes. Um, and the translation, um, and they were doing some of the more interesting things in, in publishing for, for children in France. And the translation was very much an in-house effort. It was done by the senior literary editor um, at Delpia, um, who was Bernard Noel, a poet and an author. So it's interesting. The title, let's just focus here on the, on the kind of, on the cover, on, on, on the title and the cover. Because in Where the Wild Things Are, the emphasis with that title is on the place. There's no kind of active subject implied. Um, and, you know, on the front cover, as Leonard Marcus has remarked, um, we don't see Max, he's not featured, which is fairly unusual to not see the hero or heroine to feature on the front cover and not even on the t in the title. Um, this was um, something we, you might know this, um, but you know, there's another Harper and Rowe production, Goodnight Moon, uh, that does the same thing. And the idea essentially is that the reader kind of projects them into them, themselves into the place. What's interesting then is the French title breaks um, with this enigmatic presentation of the book. And its solution instead is to take the kind of inner journey of the book, the, the sort of journey, um, through Max's anger, you know, to his sort of unconscious and, and makes that explicit, makes the Freudian undertones explicit because he's made the, Noel here has made the Maxi monsters. We know that the, Max, the monsters are Maxes. Um, so the place where the wild things are, we, we kind of know that it's symbiotic, that it's with the protagonist, with the hero. And it's interesting as well, because it's kind of playing with the consonances, the gnashing of teeth and the clashing of jaws that's kind of evoked by the sound um, of Max and the Maxi Monstre. Um, and it also kind of makes you think of Max and Moritz, a mischievous German um, children's um, characters from the 19th century. Um, but it's funny, isn't it? I mean, essentially Maxi Monsters, Maxi Monstre is not an obvious translation for wild things. You know, this is an invention of the translator. Max, Maxi, Maxi monsters are the biggest, they're the scariest. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the, the wild thing there on the front cover with his eyes closed and, and a smile on his face and very human feet there, he's got very human feet. And, you know, you can just see the claws visible in his, on his one paw that, that's kind of hinting at danger, um, but not quite. We don't really know what we're dealing with here. So it's interesting then what we can see here is how the translator, you know, translation here is an act of interpretation. Um, Bernard Noel's reading of the book kind of, oh, I think delights in the psychology of it and, and draws it out further, you know, um, by, by making that connection between Max and the Maxi Monsters. Um, and so in a sense, what he's doing here is further forcing the point that that Sendak's book represented a direct challenge to this prevailing understanding of children's literature and that strong desire in France to protect children from the more disturbing sides of human instincts. So to close, what's Interesting then is Christian Abadi Clark and, and, and others who writes of, of the importance of where the wild things are of, of, and how it became a kind of, she calls it a manifesto for the visual revolution in children's books in France. Um, and certainly we can see how 
because they talk about this, the, the Franco, um, the, there are some publishers that kind of emerge, and I'm just going to take you through a, a couple of things that they're producing um, and, and kind of the way they see themselves as revolutionary and kind of inspired in part by, by what was going on by, by people like Maurice Sendak. Um, certainly, uh, Francois Ruy Vidal and his partnership with the American publisher Harlan Quist, they set up a, a Franco American business venture in the late 60s. And they really kind of see themselves as, as trying to produce uh, books that are going to wake children up, shake things up a bit. So here, um, stories uh, uh, for children under three years of age um, with the absurdist French playwright Eugène Ionesco and the uh, Swiss artist Etienne Delessert. Um, and there is, this is a representation of um, what, uh, a walk in the park and there's 10 points to anyone who can find the little wild thing in there so they're kind of paying homage to him um, and you can see also why I kind of mentioned the question of colors in my opening panorama um, publishers felt emboldened um, to experiment a bit more I think um, if we look here, um, this book, uh, Alala, um, or Les Telemorphoses, uh, with artwork by Nicole Clavelou, French artist. Um, here, you know, they're kind of, uh, I hope you can see that, these kind of inky black um, fly leaves, they're kind of big black book. They're really enjoying kind of relishing the, the, the sort of creativity of breaking the codes using somber colors or jarring colors. Um, here, um, Cleverly, I use I, her images, uh, the one on the front front of this PowerPoint slide. I, I've, I like this book very much. I think it's lots of fun. And, you know, you can see she's really reveling in using all sorts of exciting colours. Um, and it's a psychedelic story about an interracial family, um, apparently in homage to the civil rights slogan, Black is Beautiful. So, like I say, they're kind of reveling a little bit in the creativities of, of so breaking the codes um, and colour as well. We can hear, I think you can see similar things going on here with um, that book that I talked to you right at the beginning, um, Ecole des Loisirs, uh, the French publisher on the left, took the Italian um, 1967 book, uh, the, little re the Red Balloon, and here, what's interesting, look what they've done. Um, it's, it's a book that has no words, it's just pictures. Um, and the French publisher and, and book designer have kind of taken, you can see what they really liked about it. They've, trans, they've, they've kind of made it more abstract, made it more flag-like almost. Um, they've taken the French translation is bubble, um, the adventures of a little red bubble. Um, rather than balloon, and they've removed the balloon bit, so it really does have that kind of emblematic look. And the senior editor, uh, Jean Delas, uh, recalled how they produced this book in May 68, to be precise. It was a revolutionary book. There were no words. It was a graphic poem about a bright red bubble, a colour resonant of the time. This picture book became emblematic of our publishing house. And so this clash between different visions uh, could be very creative in, in, in its, um, what happens in, in France, it was also a, a lot about provocation. Um, they, the, the French partnership, Franco-American partnership, Harlan Quist, for example, um, was a little bit different to Sendak and I think they're much more aggressive in kind of trying to be provocative. Um, trying to cause a spectacle, which is a very 68 thing to do. Um, and you, you know, you can see them being kind of influenced, I think, by the political culture of 68 um, to kind of provoke debates on what children, you know, they're using it as an opportunity to kind of think about debates about what children's books are and what they should be. You know, for Sendak, the idea was that children's books needed to be taken seriously as works of art. François Ruy Vidal of Harlan Quist then took that question to its logical conclusion by asking, is such a thing as true artistic freedom possible for children's books? And finally, just to kind of close, my last thought is that one of the key findings of the project was this pivotal role played by translation. 
that you know, books as they travel can bring with them new ideas, in, in this case, on how to speak to children and what children's books could look like. But also as they got translated, new publishers and translators saw exciting aspects that they found to be particularly innovative and sought to amplify them. So there's a connectedness in this moment, but also you know, ideas as they move can become more experimental and more radical in new contexts. And so I think that's kind of appropriate to end this talk for Mother Language Day on this thought, reflecting on the role that translations can play in driving changes, innovations, and debates. Thank you for your attention. And there's a little power to children's imaginations. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, um, Sophie, for this very rich uh, lecture. We have already a few questions in the question and answer section, uh, which I will now read out. And of course, I should like to invite uh, our attendees uh, to post more in the question and answer uh, section of this Zoom link. OK, so I'm going to uh, read out uh, the first, well, the first is a comment from Theo Reed. I hope I am uh, pronouncing your name right. He didn't realize that he was a revolutionary. He was given Sendax wild things sometime in the mid 60s as a young child. And he thinks he was so lucky to have had access to a wide range of children's books. So I don't think this is a real question, but a comment, uh, you know, a sign of enthusiasm for <laughs> the topic. Claire Squires instead, asks uh, whether, okay, so she, you, you mentioned Sophie that Sophie, that uh, French publishers didn't go to jail for contravening the 1949 law. Did they instead self-censor or did prosecutors not take forward prosecutions? And when did the law end? Okay. Oh, thank you. That's a lovely question. Um, and, and I was being a little, um, playful. There was one publisher that got taken to court, um, a comics publisher who, who published um, a lot of um, horror, horror comics. Um, and, and, and basically, he got dragged through the courts for about 10 years, you know, and that is a kind of warning to, to other publishers. Um, but I think particularly the law is designed to, to promote self-censorship because you have to, it's a kind of, it's part of the copyright processes. You have to deposit six copies of any publication that you are destined, dest that is destined for children has to be um, deposited. So after all the investment has gone into making the publication. Um, and so it is very much about kind of, um, uh, promoting a culture of kind of knowing that there's someone looking over your shoulder. But I think in the 50s and 60s, it's particularly, and I'm writing a book on this at the moment, so it, um, it's, it, it's, um, it's particularly strong because it's reinforced by a whole, that whole cadre of kind of specialists, the, that, that whole structure of feeling, I think, of the era. Um, interestingly, around 1968, there was a move to change the makeup change the, the, the people involved in the committee to kind of relax things a little. But I should say, um, it is, if you are in France and in a bookshop, you can tell if a book is for children or not legally by opening up the, opening up the book and checking in the front matter, you know, does it declare that it conforms to the 1949 law on children's publications? So it's still, it's still in vigour how much it, it, you know, kind of still makes publishers self-censor, I'm less sure. There's, there's, there's a whole load of research to be done on that, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Suzanne van der Beek um, uh, comments, the Dutch translation of Sendak's book is very similar to the French mm -hmm. translation. 
while you, as you have pointed out, there is an active interpretation of the title, do you know if this is a common translation of the title? Was this done in dialogue between international publishers? Uh, I have partially you know, provided an answer because in Italian, and this is a favorite book of mine and of my daughter, uh, the title is translated as Nel Paese dei Mostri Selvaggi, in the country of savage monsters. But of course, you should know, you, you, you know more. So tell us about what happened to this, <laughs> to the translation of this book beyond France, if you, if you know. Thank you. Uh, again, great question. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Daniela, for saving me the embarrassment of mangling your uh, lovely language. Um, no, you're right. I think it's just the Dutch uh, translation that has the same title. Otherwise, Isabel Nier uh, Chevrel has done, done some work on this. And um, according to her, most um, of the other European translations published around the same time go for the, the solution that um, the Italians went for. Um, so kind of turning the wild things into uh, savage monsters, wild monsters, um, but keeping that emphasis on place. Um, uh, so it, it's only the Dutch, I don't know why, I don't know how much dialogue there was, I mean, I think for the Dutch to be using maxi monsters, I think that has to kind of, I don't know if it comes, I think it comes from the French, but you've just exposed me as being, as having a serious <laughs> French. Okay, it's a work in progress, I mean. <laughs> and the book is very famous. Um, Sigute, I hope I'm pronouncing your names, uh, your names correctly. Uh, thanks you uh, for the very interesting presentation. And I uh, wanted to ask you whether you know that the book, uh, that, uh, Where the Wild Things Are, is connected to personal post-Holocaust experiences of uh, Muri Sendak. Um, this was one of the main reasons he created the story and illustrations. And of course, sends her greetings from Vilnius. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that, that um, when I've, I've written about this in, in more depth, um, it, it kind of, I think that that sort of post-war kind of the desire of, of, of people like Tommy Ungerer and, and like Sandak, whose lives were touched they, they, they're growing, they're, their sort of formative experience were touched by, by this trauma. Um, then as they come of age, do I think also, you know, want to kind of address that, confront that and, and become frustrated with, with the kind of protectionist, the, the kind of caretaking approach that I, that I talk about. Um, you know, Tommy Ungerer kind of famously says, you know, I think we must traumatize children and, you know, we must talk to them about gas chambers, that they existed. And so I think that, 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 that is definitely kind of where, where um, I, I was sort of reflecting on, on Sendak. Um, so yes, thank you for, for kind of bringing that out. <laughs> um, we have a comment from Aishwaraya Subramanian. Uh, given the origin of Modern Language Day, there is something nice about the fact that the little red balloon book looks like the flag of Bangladesh, which of course must be a coincidence, but still a lovely one. And uh, a question from Helen Wang. She's interested to know if you have looked beyond Europe and America at the international scene in 1868 and whether events in Asia and South America had an impact on France? Um, so it's, it's a great question. And, and, you know, the short and honest answer is um, no, I felt that this, you know, I would love to do more on that and really kind of investigate it further. I, I think when I kind of investigate translations I like to feel like I kind of work um you know I like to be able to understand the kind of the, the source culture the target culture and and so that would be a, a fantastic project and I think it's it's absolutely there um so Francois Maspero um you know he he comes to to the you know he's such an important figure in French publishing because he's one of the only ones who publishes books criticizing the the Algerian war for example um, and the little red school book you know there's a lot 
I didn't talk about that particularly, but you know that really does need to be kind of placed in that kind of global context because it, that is it's a book that's very much speaking speaking to to that the sort of anti-imperialism um, and you know becomes a kind of a global phenomenon and a global scandal um, and so I, I would you know I think it would be wonderful and I I'm, I'm ashamed to say I haven't really explored it fully no. <laughs> Um, Liliana Santos thanks you for the interesting presentation and her question is do you think children's literature still has the same amount of power influence today when it comes to being an agent of activism for children oh that's that's a wonderful question and it's it's um it's it's too wonderful to answer I, I feel I should put it back to the floor, really. <laughs> um, it's, 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 I, I always hide behind the fact that I'm a historian um, by temperament. I, I love to talk about the past. It's much safer than, than kind of, but I, I would like to think, yes, I think it does. Um, but it's, that's a, a wonderful question. And, and <laughs> well, it's a big one. I think we need to wait a little bit more uh, to historicize the current period, see what uh, what is really happening when it comes to activism for children via children's books. Um, Elizabeth Bentley um, has a comment more than a question. When she was 17 in May 68 and studied it um, as part of my languages degree, um, she later home educated her children and John Holt and Illich were both influences okay. and uh, um, she had not made uh, a connection previously between May 68 and her decision to home educate so uh, you know personal response very personal wow. response to your, <laughs> to your work uh, then we have a um, question from Milu Pereira Nihuis, uh, many adults have been, trauma have been traumatized by the Second World War and never spoke about the horrors of the war, almost as if they tried to forget about it. Do you think that by publishing books that protect the children, they also protect adults from having difficult conversations? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, short answer, but yes, I, I think absolutely. Um, very beautifully put, yes. Okay, um, and then we continue. Uh, Jan or, or Jan, do you know when the French translation was published? Uh, the Dutch was published in 1986. And I guess we just need to repeat the year in which Sendak's book was published in French. 1967. Okay. And another question from Ian or, or Jan. Have you got any idea of the influence of other media, especially TV, on the spreading of new ideas in the 70s? In the Netherlands and Flanders, they were very important in liberating children and their books. Um, yes, we, we um, and, and I sort of deliberately at the beginning used the phrase children's media, even though I disgracefully then went on to focus um, on children's books because that, that's, that's what I do. But, um, I was aware of the work of um, the Danish scholar Hella Strangard Jensen and, and sort of persuaded her to, to, to join the project. Um, and so this is where, you know, um, she, she looked at um, children's TV as being in Denmark, you know, where some really interesting experimentation was going on deliberately, you know, it, it's that sort of using, using a format that was kind of um, I think the phrase she used by the theorists was, was scrap trash culture, using using a, a media format that was um, kind of lowbrow to to really kind of produce interesting experimental um, material. I think, like you say, there there is a lot more more to be said on that though. I, I, I don't want to pretend that I could, you know, I, I, I focused very much on on children's literature, and I think there could be uh, really interesting further comparative material studies done on that and so thank you um, okay um another question from david buckingham by the way we have over 20 now in the <laughs> in the question and answer session so um so david uh says you gave 
a great talk. Uh, and he suspects that campaigns against dangerous children books uh, might appeal to people with quite a range of political motivations. In Britain, uh, the campaign against horror comics brought together the moral right and the political left, especially the Communist Party, though of course this was the early 50s. Uh, the comics were a target of for the left because of anti-American sentiments, and this was seen as evil American capitalist culture. So the politics of this are sometimes quite contradictory. Um, well, it's more than a, it's more a comment than a, than a question. Apology. No, uh, no, would you like I, to add to this? Um, it, it, thank you, David. Um, and, and nice to uh, sort of here you mentioned um, and he's right this was a discussion that that we kind of had in the conference around this was was the kind of um complex you know it, it's it's it is coming from lots of different sides and also that kind of we also talk quite a lot about that kind of liberationist approach actually being quite dogmatic in in some respects as well and and you know, could be quite rigid and, and, and <laughs> so um, thank you. Yes, it, it, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And Nicola Daly's, I think, uh, is also um, looking at a, a, a theme that has emerged in this uh, question thread already. Um, it's more a comment than a question. She thanks you for the wonderful presentation. You've given her a lot to think about, just a comment. Uh, the tension you have discussed between protection and catharsis in children's literature reminds Nicola of the tension in traditional literature, which has often been revised to protect children. And Atul Wadwani uh, asks, what do you think about the possibility of true artistic freedom regarding children's literature? Is this possible to achieve? Thank you. That, that's, again, that, that's, as a historian, I love to kind of hide behind the objectivity. Um, as, as the parent of a three-year-old well no she's just turned four um I, it's it's forcing me to kind of uh confront theory and practice which which is really quite um challenging um I, this the short answer is i think no um i i think and and the other example I, I would have talked about was the little red school book which which is deliberately provocative um and you know they're provost um inspired by that kind of dutch movement of, of aiming to kind of um, seek, provoke political change through provocation. Um, and, you know, it, it, the British publisher produces a very earnest version designed to critique the, the, the British education system, ends up being censored, takes this to the British, to the European Court of Human Rights, and, and you know, finds the court deliberations there are really interesting because they talk about these kind of two clashing worldviews that they can kind of see um, and a kind of a desire to push through a more experimental um, vision of childhood. And, and the court essentially says, no, this, 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 you can't speak to 10 year olds like this. And it's a landmark ruling that, that is very much still used in, in freedom of speech cases today. I, I, think, I think the legal answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellen Wang uh, is looking forward to reading your book. Uh, when, it, when it will it be out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you can read the stuff on the Children's 68 online, free open access. Um, that's um, on Strain IA if, you, if you're interested. <laughs> Okay. Um, Phyllis Ramage is a librarian and former children's librarian. Uh, and in her experience, contemporary children's books today still reflect uh, personal, social and political issues that affect children, can empower them and validate their experiences and instill an activist spirit in them. So that's uh, a comment as uh, a practitioner and a children's librarian. Uh, would you like to add uh, or expand on this on your collaboration with children's librarians as well. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. It's 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 good to hear um, kind of the contemporary response actually. Uh, okay. 
Um, all right. Uh, Rachel Feldman wonders if you had anything to say about Sendak's early versions of where the will things are uh, and the evolution of the monsters from wild horses into the final iteration. Do you see this as, an important, uh, as important for distinguishing between the human and the animal in any way or separating the work from that of other animal tales? That's a good mm -hmm. one. Oh, crikey. Um, I have looked at, at you know, that there, it is interesting, this question of, of the kind of evolution and, and his move to sort of more ambiguous monsters, um, going from wild horses, um, I think kind of inspired by, by um, illustrations by Ralph Caldecott from, from the late 19th century. Um, and, and, you know, how they become monstrous and, and then by sort of making them things is, is really interesting. I think that that to me seems like a quite, um, it, not just to me, um, uh, other critics, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the genius really is, is that real ambiguity of, of exactly what are they. they um, so I, I haven't thought particularly about the kind of human animal aspect, which is clearly present actually when when and you know uh the the sort of bovine aspects of, of some of the monsters uh, that's really really interesting and I, I confess i haven't properly addressed that no okay um right there are quite a few others um sorry just trying to um select a few um right here we go um mrs jadav asks you whether you feel that we have taken a step back when it comes to children's books um thank you i mean that that is and thank you everybody for for all your interesting questions so far actually it's been it's been very thought-provoking um do i I don't know if I would sort of see things in a kind of linear progression. I, I think I think we confront the same questions and and, and answer them differently. Um, I, you know, I find the late sixties a really interesting period um, where some sort of difficult questions were asked. You know, that that question of kind of um, you know is there such a thing as art true artistic freedom in children's literature? That's quite a kind of provocative thing to ask, I think is interesting. Um, and I think there, there is definitely a, a lot of kind of the sort of big, um, kind of the, the vastness of the, the global publishing industry does mean there is a, quite a lot of self-censorship today but it's this is a historian talking about the present I, you can hear me really struggling can't you it's awful um i i but i do i think i, I want to wait and historicize it and see really kind of with, with a with a sort of more objective eye what are the questions we we were asking and, and you know what that kind of confluence was um so i'm not i'm not sure i would see it as kind of forwards or backwards i suppose is essentially my <laughs> Answer. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of our students, Leilani. Oh, yeah. uh, ciao, Leilani. Uh, when would you say, Sophie, roughly, that things really started to change for children's publishing in France in terms of more freedom, less censorship for children's literature? Or is it still here today? I know that there won't be a specific date. Uh, we discussed it this greatly in the May 68 undergraduate module, but she's just wondering if there was ever a change around or post uh, 1968. Oh, Leilani, hello. And it's and it's nice of you to, to take my obsession with making you think about dates and bash me on the head with it. I think that's great. Um, I I would go with with the kind of idea that 68 is is a kind of watershed moment that that there is perceptible change um and there is a kind of a publisher's spring with kind of the, after 68 there, there are some big kind of structural changes um 
not least that kind of desire to sort of replace the panelists in, on the 1949 law committee, things like that. Um, and we do see a, a kind of a real explosion of creativity in French children's publishing in the 70s. Um, so I, I would, I, I think I definitely agree that 68 would be that moment. <laughs> Okay, thank you, uh, Sophie. I think we have completed the questions. I don't know if Ludovica can uh, confirm in the question and answer session, but I have uh, a couple of my own, if you don't mind. First of all, I really like this idea of crash sauvage and, you know, you know <laughs> I can, I, I think I've, I've seen some very strange scenes in, in you know, when my daughter was, a, was in, in, in a, a nursery and she looked very savage. But this uh, leads me to ask you something about um, gender norms. Uh, and, you know, as an Italian, I suppose, as Ludovica Serratrice, you know, has had the same experience. Um, my mother went around with Elena Giannini Bellotti's Dalla parte delle bambine uh, on the side of young girls, I think can be uh, translated into English in 1973. Uh, landmark book that questioned gender norms and stereotyping um, and she tried to raise me with, with that book <laughs> imagine that so I just wonder whether you have come across any type of um, you know um, children's books uh, that produced published in and around 1968 addressed this issue of gender stereotyping uh, head-on Thank you. Um, oh, I love that image of, of my head of department's mother. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yes, um, it, it is actually interesting. I think Julie Pagis's book talks a lot about actually how that, that kind of child rearing is a site for experimentation. It's the women that are doing it and, and oh, oh, perhaps obviously um and so there is a lot of you know she she's interviewed a lot of people talking about this kind of um the importance of kind of you know try, their parent mothers trying to raise them in a non-sexist way and books are really a big part of that we see that same impulse really reflected um in children's book publishing we see um feminist yes italian feminist publisher Adela Turin, for example, you know, inspired by Gianni Bellotti's book, um, setting up a series called Della Parte della Bambini. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it is really interesting. There's, there is a kind of a lot, and a, a lot of books kind of, and, and catalogues detailing non-sexist books for children in, in the American um, American context as well. And lollipop power, those logos right at the beginning with the little girls that, that you know, the raised clenched fist, you know, they are deliberately non-sexist children's books. Um, so yes, the, there is a lot of that, that going on and I, I would need another talk really to kind of take you all through it, but... Um, <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you. And um, uh, there are a few, uh, I think, comments in the um, in the chat uh, that perhaps we could uh, address. Um, um, I'm afraid some of the uh, I, I, identities are not so very clear because you know there are some email addresses and so on. But uh, several uh, attendees comment on the fact uh, that. Um, it's interesting to hear that forward-looking radical works for children were actually on the university syllabus in 1968. Um, and um, in general, you know, appreciation for your talk. Um, and Megan Farr mm -hmm. is also, uh, you know, um, uh, interested in uh, in the insights into the impact of 1968 revolution children's publishing in Europe, and the role of trans that translations had in this, uh, and she's looking forward to applying this uh, theory to her own research in Welsh children's publishing of the time, mm -hmm. especially on Drefven. I'm sorry, my Welsh is very dusty, who started in 1969 by publishing Welsh language co-editions of classic picture books of the time. 
So that's interesting. That's really I interesting. think. Cool. Yes. Um, Very interesting bunch. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, Gabby also finds remarkable that people in Germany may have found Sendax too scary, but had no trouble telling their children the Grimm's Tales, the original, not the Disney drag. Um, so, uh, well, you have a point there, Gabby. <laughs> um, that, and that was a point made about the 1949 law as well. You know, no fairy tale is going to make it through um, the, the sort of restrictions of the 1949 law. <laughs> And uh, Rachel Feldman um, tells us that Golan Moskowitz has published a lot about the queer context of where the, uh, where the wild things are, a queer youth escape to new spaces. Uh, and Elisa Bolki um, should be from the girl's side. I suppose she's uh, referring to the Italian the English translation of Elena Giannini Bellotti's uh, book. Um, and uh, Julia Pojeska, uh, uh, thanks you. I certainly got your, your talk got her thinking about her Cold War childhood, completely different books in Poland and England, apart from Alice in Wonderland. But that would have been available pre-1945. I do recall finding the colors and illustration in Poland in Poland far more attracted, attractive than in the UK publications. Perhaps children's books were a good place to employ people post art degrees and gave people who wanted to work with their imagination space to do so more than uh, in adult world jobs. Actually, <laughs> this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you because some of the artwork that you showed us, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, will you or have you worked on the illustrators? And you know, um, if you have, uh, is there something that you would like to share with us today about their, the way to go about or navigate their adult world jobs uh, and the children's books they produced? Um, I, I think that's um, interesting. I'm trying to work out, I, I may be slowing slightly. Um, I mean, I, I've done, did quite, talked quite a lot to um, Nicole Clavelou, who, who I used her beautiful images for the, for the poster for this. Um, you know, I, I find her fascinating. And, She's interesting because she's she's she worked um, in kind of comics for adults, graphic novels. Um, you know, she she's um, by no means just sticks to to children's literature, but ends up in the sort of seventies, late seventies, later seventies, saying, you know, I really like what's going on in children's books. Um, they you know they want to make revolution at the moment. I, I'm more interested in what they're doing. <laughs> In the comics world, which which feels very restricting to me, so it's interesting. She she clearly, I think, you know that that sort of idea of, of children's books being somehow more creative uh, was definitely um, in, important to her. Um, I don't think I've answered that question very well, but. <laughs> and we have a comment in uh, the question and answer um, area of of uh, the Zoom link uh, from Carol Botrill. When she was eight in 1968, uh, was taken to the library regularly by her granddad. She was allowed to explore books and has been a librarian for over 30 years. Working in school libraries, she has seen a shift in the publishing of children's books and issues such as refugees, for instance, written about in both picture books and fiction form. During the pandemic, there have been books published giving hope. And I wonder whether 2020, 2021, we'll see a shift post pandemic. Really interesting question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I have exhausted so far uh, the questions that I have in uh, the question and answer section. Um, right. And let's see whether there is anything else in the chat right nope i think not great uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful chair in john daniela 
<laughs> thank you so much um so i guess it probably is like the last thing to do is to thank sophie again for a fantastic talk and all our attendees we had in excess of 200 people uh, who logged in and and offered and shared the perspective and their their experiences it's been truly wonderful to see. Um, so very happy International Mother Language Day, one day late to everybody. <laughs> and I can only say that we look forward to seeing you next year. So we'll see what happens next year for International Mother Language Day. Um, and yeah, so Daniela, you want to say something? Yes, because on Twitter, people are asking whether this uh, lecture that is now being recorded will be made available yes. uh, and where could they find the link? Yeah, yeah. so so um, there's going to be a follow-up thank you email to all registered participants because I also know that a lot of people email me saying I signed up and unfortunately time zone differences I can't uh, access the talk so we, we, we've recorded this and we'll make it available on the um, Centre for Literacy and Multilingualism YouTube channel I know that you also have a YouTube channel so it'll be yes. um, your YouTube channel as well um, and then again we'll, people will also have uh, an opportunity to put the links of our centres of course we've got you know a lot of online events coming up now so it's a really good opportunity for people wherever they are to come to our centers and see what's going on um so yeah so information will follow um in a couple of days and i think also um uh, sophie's got some some exciting news about something happening in may that we might want to share uh, with the attendees of this workshop because they might find that relevant and interesting so yes definitely a lot of information coming following up this um so thank you very much. I know there are people that have stayed up very late um, in Asia <laughs> so, so yes. uh, to follow this. So, so we can, you know, unfortunately we can't see them, uh, but we imagine them all out there. So, I feel you. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody. Thank but you. thank you, especially Sophie, for a really, really, really wonderful talk. And thanks, Daniel, again for sharing. Thank yes. you all. Thank, thank you, you. Rebecca, for your hospitality. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.